welcome everybody to this inaugural uh, forum of the Modern Money, Modern Money Network New South Wales. Um, I'll just say a few little words about the, uh, the, the Modern Money Network before we start because we're an emerging organisation of people from across Australia who uh, have come together to form a, a network of people who, are, who want to counter the myths of how our monetary system works and how it can be better used for uh, social equality. Um, our Melbourne colleagues have, uh, have been doing monthly forums for a few months now uh, and uh, I asked on a Facebook book forum whether uh, there was a, an equivalent uh, event to be happening in Sydney and uh, the response was no there's not but you might want to start one. So, <laughs> so uh, we, we started uh, this New South Wales chapter of what we're now calling the Modern, modern Money Australia. Um, it's, uh, as Bill Mitchell f found out about uh, the fact that uh, I'd been asked to start one on the Facebook group and he put me in touch with Jane Flanagan. So Jane was here some of the years. <laughs> so she and I then called a meeting of some interested people and uh, we've had a couple of those. So far we've got, uh, we've got a bank account, we've got an ABN, we've got an unincorporated association and we'll be seeking incorporation shortly. Uh, and we'll be forming a network of people around Australia. So there are already people in Melbourne, of course, they've been doing their forums now for a couple of months. Um, and uh, there are people in South Australia, in Western Australia and Queensland who are interested in starting similar kinds of chapters. So we'll be, we'll be advancing this network as time proceeds, but um, we're, at the moment we're pretty much focused on running these kinds of forums. Uh, but we're looking at other things that we might do, which might be advocacy, lobbying, um, and we'll also be wanting to form networks, international networks, so with people like the Mon Modern Money Network in the US, uh, with the GAR Institute for, the GAR Initiative for, for Modern Money in the UK, and other similar groups around the world. So that's our aim, and we'd encourage people to get involved, to get interested, join our mailing list, if you want to be involved on, a, on an organisational basis, we'd welcome your input. If you just want to come to the forums, that's fine as well. So we'll be doing these at the moment monthly, but it may depend on whether we can get speakers or not as well. So there aren't a huge number of people uh, who are academics like Professor Mitchell in, in uh, Australia. So it might have to be occasional forums as time proceeds. Uh, as we can get people to come and speak at these forums. But we'll try to do it as monthly as much as we can possibly manage. Uh, so now onto our speakers. Um, we've got uh, two very uh, esteemed speakers here today. Professor Bill Mitchell is the first. I'll introduce them both now and then they can just uh, kind of tag team uh, as they speak. Each will speak for about half an hour or make go over a bit. We've got until about four in this venue and we'll have question and answers at the end. So Professor Bill Mitchell holds the Chair of Economics and is the Director of the Centre for Full Employment and Equity with the wonderful ac acronym COFFEE, uh, which is an official research centre at the University of Newcastle. He's also the Docent Professor in Global Political Economy at the University of Helsinki. He's the author of various books, including Eurozone Dystopia, which we'll be giving away a copy of a little later in the program. You've all got your raffle tickets, I think. Sorry, what? <laughs> Uh, and which was published by Elgar in 2015 and Reclaiming the State, published by Pluto Books in, uh, in 2017. His most recent book, Macroeconomics, written in association with Professor L. Randall Ray and Dr. Martin Watts, was published by Macmillan in February of 2019. He's published widely in refereed academic journals and books and regularly is invited to give keynote conference presentations in Australia and overseas. He has an established record in macroeconomics, labour and market studies, econometric modelling, regional economics and economic development, and of course he's one of the founders of modern monetary theory. He's received regular grants from the ARC and he has an extensive experience as a consultant to the Australian government, trade unions and community organisations and several international organisations including the European Commission, the International Labour Organisation and the Asian Development Bank. He also maintains a high commitment to community activities and has been regularly called to appear as an expert witness in industrial matters in the relevant state and federal tribunals and at various Senate and House of Representatives inquiries. 
He regularly provides commentary on economic developments in the national ra on, in the national radio and press in Australia. And his daily blog, which I'm sure many of you have read and done his week, uh, weekend quizzes, uh, is one of the leading economics blogs in the world. And to top all of that, and I don't know how he ever finds the time after writing uh, thousands of words a week on his blog, he's also a professional musician and plays in the Melbourne reggae dub rock steady band Pressure Drop, which he founded in 1978. <laughs> so, uh, our other guest is Rowan Gray. We'd uh, originally planned for our first um, forum of this kind to be in September, but Rowan said that he was going to be in Sydney in August, and we thought, well, let's bring it forward to August, so we decided to run it in August. Um, so uh, Rowan is uh, originally from Newtown. You'll hear from his accent that he actually doesn't have an American accent. <laughs> and studied political economy as an undergraduate at Sydney University. But he's lived and worked in the United States for the past 10 years, where he's president of the Modern Money Network, with which many of us are familiar. He's a doctoral fellow at Cornell Law School, where his research focuses on the design and regulation of money in this internet age. Rowan is a director of the US National Jobs for All Network, a research director of the Digital Fair Currency Institute, a research scholar at the Global Institute for Sustainable Prosperity, a consultant with the International Telecommunications Union's focus group on digital currency, a network manager with Freedom Box Foundation, which is worth looking up, uh, and a teaching fellow at the Clark Business Law Institute's program on the law and regulation of financial markets and institutions. He previously worked as an attorney for children in New York City, as an elementary school teacher, and as a professional musician. So we've got two musicians here speaking to us today, along with their other uh, high qualifications. So we've got, uh, the first one we'll be hearing for is Professor Bill Mitchell, and I'll hand over to him, and then they'll just, just tag team. So welcome, Professor Mitchell. Okay, thanks, Dallas. Uh, <coughs> I'm sort of overdressed, but I'm an economist, so uh, we're weird. Um, uh, probably, this will go for longer than 30 minutes, so I'm just going to go up to the 30, 35 minutes and we'll see how far we get. And what I thought I'd do today was just to ingrain some of the basic elements of modern monetary theory that we d we've been developing for 25 odd years, that even Nobel Prize winners allegedly can't get right. And so you should leave today, even though you mightn't get through the whole program, you'll leave with very good understanding of our work and that's the aim. Uh, for those, this is, I'm not trying to sell books, but this, this is our new macro book. It's the first uh, MMT book from inception. It sold out within two months, which Macmillan couldn't believe. Macmillan are the largest textbook publishers in the world. And uh, it's gone crazy, in which tells me that there's a thirst for something quite different in economics, which has been sterile and disastrously misleading for decades. And I, I made the point in London when we launched the book that this is the first non-fiction book in decades for years. <laughs> Uh, I, 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 just the top quotes, the interesting one. This was this this is quote from a bill before the U.S. Congress that uh, uh, they want to condemn MMT because it's a danger to the United States, and uh, that came on the back of a series of very uh, of leading uh, economists, macroeconomists of the type that you might have been, as progressive-minded people, might have been leaning towards in the past, Krug, Paul Krugman, Lawrence Summers, Rogo Kenneth Rogoff, and a whole range of others of that ilk who have been condemning us as well. And what that tells me is that for 25 years we've been working on this program. We started off with just a couple of us, and now it's expanding, obviously. And for many of those years, we were totally ignored. Uh, 
then we started to get a bit of attention. Now we've got major hostility coming from the, the mainstream. And if uh, my studies in philosophy of science tells me, that means we're in the midst of paradigm shift. Mm. And you know, Larry Summers uh, in March said we're grotesque. The theory is grotesque. Uh, yesterday, or August 23rd, that's yesterday, he's coming out making all these statements that are chapter and verse in our textbook, saying that this is what he believes, but we're grotesque. And what you're seeing is part of a paradigm shift going on, and this is uh, common if you've studied the way in which uh, scientific disciplines uh, uh, shift over time. What you're seeing is that there's a whole group that will never shift, and then there's this group of people who are sort of stuck, but stuck betwixt, and they're now trying to reinvent themselves without acknowledging what they're doing, as if they're claiming our work without admitting it. That's what's happening. So I'm very pleased about that. So now this is really basic nuts and bolts MMT today. It's not a political discussion. It's not a policy discussion. It's it's and and it's probably too nice a day to be doing this, but we're doing it. And thanks very much for taking the time. So let's start our journey. When we're thinking about a monetary system, and mo what modern monetary theory is about is the monetary system. And how do, we con how do we start our construction and our understanding of that? Well, the story starts with a government who wants to provision itself. So if you look over here, we've got all these things in the non-government sector which is the private domestic sector, us, and the external sector. We've got all these resources. The government doesn't own anything particularly. And it's got a, it's got a, a, a socio-economic platform to fulfil its policies, and it requires real resources to fulfil that policy platform. And so its task, its, its its problem is to transfer all of these resources so that it can provide services and infrastructure and what have you. Its, it's, its task is to transfer them to it, the public sector. That's what the role of government and is, and that's how we start thinking about the monetary system. How does the government provision itself? That's the first problem that has to be achieved. OK, so. The next part of the story, once we understand that's what we're starting with, a government's coming in, how does it get real resources to do what it wants? Well, it introduces a new currency. And I noted earlier today there was a, a, a bit of paper with my photo on it masquerading <coughs> as a currency. Well, that's a counterfeit currency because we've just introduced a new one today and it's called the M. And it could be the Mitchell, but it's probably the modern monetary land currency, the M. And we just introduce this, so, so if you think about, and, and in economic thinking you've often got to ab, uh, abstract from complexity and go back to uh, uh, just intrinsic relationships. And so think about, a, think about a land where the government isn't there and then the, and it's, got, it's got things happening, people are doing stuff and converting real resources to their, to their ends. And you think about a government coming into that land, how does it get to provision itself? Well, it introduces a new currency. And so then the question is, and this is an important slide, before I say what the question is, because in this land we're very sophisticated and everything's digital. So why I said that was because it's, it's disabusing you of the notion of thinking in terms of printing money. When, when governments don't print money when they're running their fiscal policy. And you see all these big economists coming out and MMT is mad because they're just about printing money. So we're a digital world. All government spending is mostly digital. Computer keystrokes. So this is the problem for this government that wants to provision itself and, re and has worked out that it provisions itself by introducing its own fiat currency. Now, a fiat currency is intrinsically worthless. 
It's not like the old commodity currencies of like gold and silver, which had intrinsic face value because of what they were. So the question then is, why would anyone... The government announces, goes into this new place and says, we're the government, we're, this is the currency. Why would anyone want it? It's worthless. They've already, they've already got markets and exchanges and they've already got a currency, probably. Why would they want the government's currency, which it's thinking is going to be the vehicle in which it provisions itself? Well, we've got to understand how the currency becomes demanded by the non-government sector, us. And so the problem that the government imposes on the non-government sector is it announces that everybody, every period, has to pay 100 M's. It imposes a tax. Now, we could get very complex about what sort of the tax structure would look like, but that's unnecessary at this stage. And so the problem then is, OK, the government's just announced that the non-government sector has to deliver in total 100 M's. The problem for the non-government sector is, where do we get the M's from? The M's are the exclusive right of issuance of the government. And so the solution to that part of the problem is the government then announces that it will spend M's into the economy, into existence is the way we say it. OK, now here's a bit of arithmetic that allows us to understand how this all operates. Now, there's a lot, the next table looks pretty complicated, but it's not really. So the government's on the left-hand side, the non-government's on the right-hand side. At the top here, we've got what we call flows, and I'll explain that. And at the bottom, we've got what we call balance sheet items or stocks, and I'll explain that. So here's, here's, the, here's the situation. The government then announces, after it's announced the tax of 100 M's, it announces that it's willing to hire anyone to do stuff for it, provision itself, and it'll pay, in the first instance, 100 M's in wages. And so immediately, whereas before that announcement was made and after the announcement of the tax <coughs> obligation, people were saying, oh, yeah, we're not, you know, why would we want that worthless currency? Well, as soon as the tax obligation's announced, they've immediately got an incentive to get it Otherwise, they go to prison for tax evasion. And so immediately, you've got people wanting that currency and willing to offer up real resources, labour, capital, machines, time, whatever, expertise, willing to offer those resources to the government in return for its currency so that it can satisfy its tax obligations. So we've now created a demand for the currency and the government is now using fiscal policy, which is spending and taxation, to spend that currency into existence. So that spending then generates income in the non-government sector of 100, in the form of wages in this case. And the income can then provide, provides the wherewithal to pay the taxes, and the government receives 100 in taxes. Now, follow these arrows. This is the causality of the monetary system. That's the causality. The mainstream economics tells you the causality goes exactly the opposite way. The taxes provide the funds to, for the government to spend. And you've all been told relentlessly that your taxpayers, yes, you are taxpayers, we pay taxes, but, but it's, it's allegedly taxpayers' money that the government's spending. Well, no, it's not. They had to spend it first before we could get the currency to pay the taxes. It's absolutely opposite to the way the mainstream macroeconomics thinks and is taught. Now, the next thing is to look at... And by the way, uh, back... 
these are what we call flows. They're flows of money over, over a period. And at the end of the period, year one we've got up here, year one, at the end of the period, we do some further arithmetic and look at the uh, non-government sector. It got 100 M's, it had to pay out 100 M's, and so at the end it hasn't got any M's left. So its saving in year one is zero M's. Now have a look at the government side. And I've deliberately called this fiscal injection rather than fiscal balance or fiscal deficit because language and terminology is quite important in constructing the way we see things and understand things. So the government's... A, a fiscal balance is the difference between spending and taxation. And so in this case, the government spent 100 and received 100 back there's been no net injection of government money into the economy in year one. And we'd say that was a balanced budget. Now, I don't use the word budget because households have budgets. A currency issuing government doesn't have a budget constraint. More later on that. OK, so that's year one. And because there's been no debt issued, and there's been no saving, there's no stocks of wealth in this economy yet. There's nothing left over at the end of the period. All the flows have cancelled out. Year two, quickly, the government now decides it wants to increase employment in the economy, it wants to offer more public services, it wants to build some more infrastructure, so it now spends 120, hires extra <coughs> workers, and that 120 becomes income, and you can see the causality. Government spending generates income in the non-government sector. And you can see that now taxes haven't been changed, so the government's taking out 100, the causality again. Now, the difference in year two is that the non-government sector has been able to save 20 because it's only, it received 120, but it was taxed 100. And look at the fiscal injection. It's now the government spent 120, got it back 100 in tax revenue, and so it left 20 M's in the economy. And in regular parlance, it ran a deficit of 20, a fiscal deficit. But, it, but the way I think about it is it's injected a positive 20 into the economy and left it there, untaxed. And look here now for in our so-called stocks. Stocks are measures of things at a point in time. That's the way we think of stocks. So wealth is a stock, income is a flow. And so at the end of year two, these, this saving of 20 in the non-government sector becomes a, a financial asset of 20 in the form of cash. Year three. The government continues to run a deficit of 20 and in year three the flow is another 20 of saving and that accumulates now to 40 units of M's of financial wealth. 20 from the last period, 20 this period. So the wealth of the non-government sector has risen by 20 to 40 and I'll explain this next bit in a second and if you think about the two years the wealth in the non-government sector is just the cumulative injections of the government sector, the cumulative deficits. 20 last period, 20 this period, that's provided 40 savings to the non-government sector and that's its wealth at this point in time. Are the eyes glazing over yet? No. Mine are, but... <laughs> uh, and what the government does in this case is that in the previous year, this 20 cash is what we call non-interest bearing. It's just M sitting in a, a deposit account earning nothing. And so the government may well uh, say to the non-government sector, here's, here's a bond, a public debt instrument, a, a, a piece of paper that guarantees if you give us this money, we'll give it back to you with interest. And so this bond, 
uh, they offer to convert the portfolio from cash to, to bonds, from a non-interest bearing asset to an interest bearing asset. That's what a bond issuing <coughs> program does. And it allows the non-government sector to arrange its portfolio of wealth in a way that they, because bonds slightly less liquid than cash. Liquid means that you can get it immediately. You can spend it immediately. And that's why the interest is paid on it. And so the non-government sector in this case has decided to hold no cash, but that's just, it could have some mixer there. Oh. We uh, get a message from the IMF, we're about to go broke. And all these mainstream economists are on the ABC. By the way, the ABC basically is, doesn't talk to me anymore. Oh, I can tell you a story about uh, Q&A earlier this year. One political party refused to appear with me. And it wasn't the one you think. <laughs> Disgrace. So basically now we've got the mainstream narrative emerging in this story, just to, just to show you what happens when that narrative dominates. And so we've been running deficits now. Our deficits have accumulated to uh, 20 last year, 20 this year, and now we've got public debt of 40. And uh, there, this is a mainstream horror show because what they're saying is interest rates are going to rise, that inflation will occur and the government will go broke. OK, so we express that now in the government then cuts back public spending to 80. Now, four of that is the interest paid on... We, we offered the bonds at 10%, keep it simple. So that's 10% of 40 is four, and the wages we're offering, 76 so we've cut employment by, by 20, 46 M's, significant drop in non-government employment going on here. And of course that translates into, we don't alter the tax obligations. And so that translates into income of 80, because spending equals income, always, in macroeconomics. And uh, taxes of 100, so how the hell does the non-government sector pay its taxes? Because now it's got a... Uh, it's in deficit. It's got income of 80, but it's got to pay 100 to the government in taxes. So the way it can do that, do that is to run down its prior savings. And so the overall save, they're dis-saving now in year four of 20. And what that, and, and you can see that the fiscal injection is minus 20. That would be said in mainstream parlance as the government running a surplus of 20. Is doesn't, isn't that what we aspire to? That's what the mainstream tell us is exemplary, exemplary and responsible fiscal policy. Now, looking down here is interesting because you can now see that financial wealth has dropped to 20 in the non-government sector and government bonds have dropped to 20, were 40. Why did that happen? It happened because the only way the non-government sector, which doesn't issue the currency, can f pay taxes greater than its income is by running down prior built-up wealth. In this case, they have to flog off some of their bonds, convert them into cash, and give the cash back to the government. Now, if this austerity continued... Have I got an out yet? Uh, sorry. Yeah, so now their non-government sector wealth is less. And if that austerity continued, well, then you're going to have uh, bankruptcies and, and deep recessions and all the rest of it. I'm going to skip this graph. It's too real world. So these are the basic principles that we've learned. Spending drives taxes, not the other way around. Taxes do not fund government spending. It's the other... Spending funds taxes. Now, that's difficult for people to get their heads around when they've been brainwashed the other way for all their lives. We've learned that taxes create the demand for government spending, not to raise revenue, 
Until there's spending, there's no capacity to pay taxes. We've learned about the desire to save. The non, if, if the non-government sector wants to save in the currency of issue, then the government has to run a deficit. It, it can't save without the government running deficits. Can't. Here's a way of thinking about public debt. Public debt, outstanding, the government debt, is just untaxed spending. Think back to the numbers. The only way that we could build up 40 was because it was spending in excess of taxes. Government debt is untaxed prior spending. And it just is an accounting record of the previous deficits that the government has been running. And all the government is doing is borrowing back its own currency that it spent previously. The bonds that are issued by the Australian Office of Financial Management on behalf of the Australian Treasury are not funding government spending. The government spending in the past created the liquidity that can then be used to buy the bonds. Now that's, that's totally the opposite of the way you've been led to believe. Accumulated public deficits equal the accumulated non-government savings or wealth. Bonds are our wealth. And the interest payments that we receive on our bonds holdings are our incomes. So when Peter Costello was running those fiscal surpluses and raving on about how he was getting the debt monkey off our backs. What he was doing was destroying our wealth and destroying our income flows from our accumulated savings. That's what he was doing. And that's the point I've just made. So when we think about uh, austerity, in year four, of that example, the government was acting in an exemplary fashion according to the neoliberal orthodoxy. It was generating surpluses, retiring debt as they say, whereas from an MMT perspective, non-government debt, that's our wealth, that's our wealth, was being destroyed, our income flows were being destroyed and employment and outcome was being constrained and ultimately it would cause recession. All right, so how long have I been going for? About 10, yeah. Okay, so, so just in what I've said today, you've got more economics education than a three-year mainstream graduate. <laughs> it's not a joke, it's tragic. <laughs> if you just go away today and understand that as, the, as, the, as, as a, a, a basis for then exploring further things, then you're really in a good shape to, to, to understand why the orthodoxy is, uh, uh, is mythical. So here's some more. And I'll just go through these things very quickly uh, without, because each one of these I've given le whole lectures on. So the first thing to understand I often see in, on social media, and I'm often asked by journalists, uh, mostly abroad, not here, is, oh, when we have MMT, things will be better. And I see a lot of progressives saying, well, when we get to MM, an MMT world, things will be a lot better. Well, MM, modern monetary theory isn't a regime that you move to. It's a framework for understanding the system that's out there in, that we live in. It's a superior way of understanding our monetary system. It's not something we're going to have it in some utopia. And it's really important to get that absolutely grounded. That it, it's what the system is. It's just our way of understanding it. So it's a lens to achieve a superior understanding of the way the monetary system operates 
and the capacities of the currency issuer within that monetary system. And why I think it's superior, because it exposes the myths that are peddled out by the mainstream and the top end of town and all the other uh, snouts in the trough that is attempt to suppress in our minds what the capacities of our elected governments are. When the government announces a huge submarine bid or something that's going to feed the military industrial complex, no one says where does the money come from. But when someone wants to uh, lift New Start above the increasing gap between the poverty line, it's an absolute, it's a human rights tragedy. Then everyone's going, how can we afford it? And, and the Labor Party treasurer said the other day, well, we can have some progressive things as long as they don't interfere with our uh, achievement of a surplus. <coughs> and anybody in this room that votes for Labor should stop voting for them as a consequence of that single statement. And what I argue is that MMT, because it provides a superior understanding, lifts the veil of ideology. Governments can no, uh, politicians can no longer tell us that we've got 13% uh, labour underutilisation and the unemployed within that 13%, the 5.2%, are going to be forced to live in, in uh, below the poverty line indefinitely because we can't afford to do anything. Because if everyone understands MMT, you would, they would know immediately they couldn't get away with that BS. And so the, what I argue is that the standards of our democracy would be improved if we all got, got this in our heads. And the, the next thing to understand is because it's, only, it's a lens, an understanding framework, to operationalise policy requires we impose our values over that understanding. And, you know, on the, I get criticised, hammered every day on Twitter and all this, not that I really participate in that, but that, I, that oh, uh, uh, the Italian government's becoming very MMT-ish. It must be, a, MMT must be a fascist plot. It's mostly from these characters that hate my, British characters that hate my position on Brexit. I'm a, a, a lexiter. A lever, and, uh, and what they're saying is because the right wing uh, in some places are liking MMT, it must be something to do with the dark beginnings of MMT. Well, I'm really happy that the right wing like MMT because that's going to flush them out to admitting what they're doing rather than what they pretend they're doing. So the point is that MMT is really agnostic about left or right in, those, in that sort of concept. I happen to be left, but there are MMTs that are quite right. But we share the understanding. What having your own currency means, very quickly, is that the government can purchase anything for sale in that currency, including all idle labour. And what that means is that once the non-government sector's spending decisions have been made, if there's any mass unemployment left, that's a deliberate policy choice of government because the government could employ all that labour if it wanted to. So when, you, when you're... You know, I've been uh, sitting in rooms of the IMF in the developing countries and they've been saying, we can't do anything about this unemployment, you know, 60% unemployment. We can't do anything about it because it's a complex issue. No, it's not. A currency issuing government can always hire the labour if it wants to. <coughs> What's the appropriate fiscal position? Well, I'll just go back here. This second bit, there's, there's one level of... Spending creates income and output and jobs. There's one level of spending at any point in time that's consistent with everybody being able to find work that wants work. And that then tells you what the appropriate fiscal position for the government is. There, there's no sense that a particular number should be targeted by the government, deficit number or surplus number. As I say, it all depends. A 10% fiscal deficit of GDP might be totally appropriate, as a 2% surplus might be totally appropriate. All depends upon 
the spending levels from the other sectors. And so fiscal policy should never be about achieving a particular outcome in terms of financial numbers. What the government's got to do is ensure that once the non-government sector is spent, there is sufficient public spending to generate enough economic <coughs> activity and employment, and that's the end of it. And whatever the fiscal outcome is, is. It's not even a number we should even look at. We should be looking at who's got jobs, what's the quality of work, are we operating in a climate change sustainable way, and all the rest of the things that matter. And if that's a 10% fiscal deficit, fine. If it's a 2% deficit, fine. If it's a 1% surplus, fine. And what we're seeing, uh, uh, what we're seeing now is that uh, a lot of central bankers are coming out. This is the paradigm shift that's starting to go on. Uh, now admitting that monetary policy isn't effective. This dominance, uh, the neoliberal paradigm uh, uh, took took the dominant fiscal policy out of the play and put macroeconomic policy in the hands of unelected, unaccountable officials in our central banks. It was what I call depoliticisation. Because the government could always say, oh, that's the central bank's decision. Well, how do we get to elect the central bank? We don't. And so what's happening is that after the GFC, we're seeing very clearly that monetary policy is very ineffective. It's something that we've been saying all along for 25 years at least. And now we're getting uh, much more action on the fiscal front and fiscal policy is heading to dominance. That's the MMT position. But I could go in a lot more about that, but I won't. Uh, I won't go in there. This is an important point. There's a, there's a lot of people that think there are degrees of monetary sovereignty. And I disagree with them. There's, there, if, you, if you issue your own currency and you float it on international markets, then you're sovereign. That's it. Because what that means is that you can buy any idle productive resources and bring them back in, that, that are for sale in your currency, and you can bring them back into productive use. That's what monetary sovereignty is. Now the question then is, does that mean that monetary sovereignty will always make a nation materially rich? Of course not. Some of the countries I've worked in abroad are, are materially poor because they've got hardly any real resources. And so a, a government who's monetarily sovereign can bring all the real resources that are available and for sale into productive use one way or another but that might be a very poor country still. Uh, and, and the last thing I'm going to say is uh, that, a, that a, we have to realise that a currency issuing government has two options to maintain price stability and they are you either use unemployment buffer stocks or employment buffer stocks. And this is a whole separate lecture. But the MMT solution to maintaining price stability and full employment is a, is a job guarantee. And it's the only policy flow that's intrinsic to the, the body of work we call MMT. Now, it's not, it's, it's not a reflection of a progressive value set, the job guarantee. Remember I said you have to impose a value system over the lens. The job guarantee is the is de derivative of the understanding that A, it's desirable to have efficiency of resource use, and that means not wasting any resources, and it's also desirable to be able to push the economy to using all the available resources, because that way you maximise output and income, and we should be doing that in a sustainable way. But uh, um, it's also desirable to do that without getting accelerating inflation. So we need a macro stability framework. Now then the question is, well if you do it through the unemployment way, which is the way the orthodoxy and the way we do it out there now, 
we run, we run higher or lower unemployment depending on price pressures. That's an incredibly wasteful way of disciplining price inflation. It's incredibly costly, both in terms of lost income and output, but also in the personal consequences of those that have to endure the unemployment. And so it can't possibly be an efficient use of resources to run a price stability framework using buffer stocks of unemployed. <coughs> And so the only other option is to use buffer stocks of employment. That, that provides a job for anyone who wants it, but it also disciplines the price process. Now, I'm, I'm leaving you up in the air there because it's, that's another lecture. But that's intrinsic to the MMT way. All right, so that's the end of my talk. Thanks very much. Does anybody need a quick toilet break or anything like that? No, we're all right. We'll carry on. Cool. All right, well, thank you very much, welcome, and thanks for coming out on a Saturday. Um, I won't try to give a basic talk. Bill has spent many decades uh, perfecting that much better than I can, and there's um, literally, at this point, hundreds of talks and videos out there. So what I'm gonna do is give kind of two things. Um, one is a set of sort of vignettes that um, identify or, or highlight some points that I think are relevant from my time sort of on this journey or learning these ideas. And the other is some insights or thoughts that might help guide the modern money Australia into the, the next step. So the first, um, I'm a lawyer. Uh, I was trained as an undergrad as a political economist briefly, but I primarily identify as a lawyer. So I come to this and think slightly differently to the economists on some of these issues, not because I disagree with them, but because I have a different um, emphasis. And often they're very complementary uh, in the sense that a lot of the ideas that economists can identify or argue from a point of logic often have support in the legal history or the legal institutions. So to just give one example of that, um, MMT talks very well about the way that taxes drive the value of money, and there's a lot of legal support in, in the historical literature around how states get formed, how um, you know, warlords or political sovereigns um, in, engage in this from a from sort of set up legal systems. Um, but when MMT talks about the word tax there, another way to think about that word is a non-reciprocal, uh, hierarchically imposed obligation. So, if you might remember in um, 2009 when President Obama introduced the Affordable Care Act and there was the uh, mandate to buy health insurance and people said this is unfreedom, this is you know, a violation of my liberty and the Supreme Court headed by a Republican who was not at all friendly to um, that kind of legislation ultimately said no, that's just a tax. You, you might experience it as a mandate or something but it's just a tax. When you're a lawyer and you go to court and you have judgments that force someone to pay a contract or to pay damages if they you know, violate a duty of care, you know, hit you with their car or something like that, uh, or if you're in Ferguson, Missouri and you have to pay criminal fines for being black, um, then those are examples of a tax. They don't come up in the federal budget numbers, but they function for average people as a tax. And you can imagine a world where even if you're the kind of person that doesn't earn any income because you're poor or you're retired, the kind of person that billionaires in America might say mean that you don't deserve a vote because you didn't pay for the government, um, you didn't contribute your fair share. Um, if you're that kind of person, you might still find yourself under the yoke of fees, fines, medical bills, things that are you're forced to pay in a currency set by the government. So that when we think of a tax there, it can be something quite broad as long as it creates that demand for you to accumulate money. And I give the example that I may not think that I have any obligations in this country while I'm here for the month before I go back to America. But if I use my parents' car to drive somewhere and I hit somebody, I could be very liable to pay a lot of money. Every time I get in that car, I'm taking a risk that I could incur a real large amount of monetary damages. So even though that's not a tax that I'm definitely going to get every month, 
that might be enough to keep me in the monetary system, to keep me wanting to earn money, to keep me wanting to save money. And so when we look at that desire to net save that Bill had up in his image, in addition to paying your taxes that you know you're gonna to have to pay, the risk that you might incur some form of legal liability might be enough to keep you in that system. And there's a very uh, often quoted statistic recently about the state of poverty in America that something like 60% of people uh, could not afford a financial emergency if it cost them more than $400 right now. They would go bankrupt. So for people like that, they do not have a level of financial security that means they can say, I don't need to keep earning money. The act of having the ability to earn money is incredibly important because money means security and freedom from some sort of legal or economic risk. Um, so often people say, well, what if there's no taxes or if someone pays no taxes, does that mean they, you know, MMT doesn't apply or MMT is inaccurate? No, as long as you have the risk of needing to pay, that can function for many people as real as actually having a tax bill in terms of forcing you to want to um, earn and, and save money. Uh, another lesson that comes out of my experience in the US is the lesson of the um, civil rights movement. There are people who've been arguing for a human right to a job or a legal right to work um, for decades, going back to FDR or going back to the 18th century with people like Thomas Paine. Um, but when the civil rights movement uh, achieved a set of uh, legal and political rights in the 1960s, the next phase that they identified was to move into social and economic rights. And depending on sort of how conspiracy theory minded you are, that's one of the reasons why um, Martin Luther King didn't survive longer than he did. Um, but his wife, Coretta Scott King, who in many respects was one of the driving forces to get him to focus more on economic injustice late in his life, um, kept up the fight for full employment. And in the 70s, formed a large action council that mobilized environmentalists, um, feminists, black political leaders, etc., labor organizers, um, to the point where there was a full employment bill uh, put up in the 1970s, the Humphrey Hawkins Full Employment Bill, that included a legal right to work. That bill was ultimately um, scuttled, uh, largely watered down to the point of irrelevance, or at least to the point of impotence, um, in part because of testimony by central bankers that, that such a program while maybe morally feel good, would be economically destabilizing. So the last serious push in the United States for a full employment bill was in part dashed on the rocks of macroeconomic credibility by people in the positions of power um, that are still in the positions of power today that um, Bill was identifying in his talk. The Larry Summerses of their time would have said, well, we're very progressive, but we just think this one's too far. Um, and I think one of the points the MMT shows, as Bill said, is that we can think that big and we don't have to keep throwing the most marginalised under the bus in the name of that kind of uh, reasonable balance. Another uh, issue that was pretty dear to my, um, my time in law school, I wrote my major writing credit on it at the time, because I was in law school from 2011 to 2014, was uh, the government shutdown and the debt ceiling crisis in the United States. You might have heard of this. Um, President Obama afterwards described it as the single largest issue in his presidency, uh, which given the things going on in the world right now seems uh, pretty crazy. But uh, the issue at the time was that uh, Congress had authorized or committed through appropriations a certain amount of spending to occur. Uh, and had put in a number of taxes that meant a certain amount of tax revenue was going to be sucked back out of the economy. Um, and that difference uh, was not typically allowed to be financed through a direct overdraft on the Treasury's account at the Federal Reserve. So normally what would happen is the, tre the Treasury would spend and then to ensure that there was enough in their account for the next day to spend again, they would sell Treasury bonds. Uh, and when the amount of treasury bonds that they were trying to issue hit the legal statutory limit, historically what would happen is they would pass another bill saying, we'll just raise the limit. And you know, it's sort of a nice game. You kind of play this one, two, you spend, and then you raise the deal, and you spend. Uh, but when Mitch McConnell and the Republicans decided to play scorched earth politics, suddenly that sort of gentleman's agreement uh, broke down. And so you had a situation where Congress had told the Treasury to make a certain amount of payments, to issue a certain amount of taxes, and to not issue more than a certain amount of bonds. And a lot of very serious people, both serious lawyers, serious economists said, well, there's nothing the government can do. It's a legal dilemma. 
It's a legal problem unless they pass a new law or change the budget process, which there's no political support for right now, the president is going to have to break one of those laws. Going to have to spend more than they've been allowed to, or spend less, tax more, or blow through the debt ceiling. And funnily enough, one lawyer who had been frequenting MMT blogs for a long time, he's just a private lawyer in Atlanta, um, came across an obscure provision of the Coinage Act that said actually the Treasury is allowed to mint as many platinum proof coins as the Treasury Secretary wishes to issue and put whatever denomination on it. So let's just issue a trillion dollar coin, put it in the government's account at the Fed, and there we are, we can keep spending without issuing, you know, the legal problem is resolved. Um, now, I agree with MMT, I think this kind of silly budget games is nothing more than that, it's silly budget games. And if you're a lawyer whose job is to care about the little regulatory details, that might be important. If you're a constitutional lawyer, that might be irrelevant. And certainly if you're someone trying to understand the real limits on policy, it's irrelevant. But at this point, those serious scholars said, no, 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 there are all these reasons legally why we couldn't possibly do that. What the president should do, and this is the more reasonable option, is just violate the debt ceiling, violate the constitution, and ask for forgiveness afterwards, kind of like President Lincoln did when he suspended habeas corpus and held prisoners without trial during the Civil War. Um, and when you're advocating mandatory detention as the kind of analogy we should be reaching for, rather than telling the truth about how money works, and that was ultimately what it came down to, because later on he said, look, this might even legally work. Maybe you could get five judges to agree this coinage thing would work. Maybe it wouldn't even you know, create hyperinflation and blow up the economy, but it would reveal to people how money works. And that would be so destabilizing that we should avoid it. So this is an academic whose job is to be a public educator and a lawyer advocating the president violate the constitution rather than just tell people how money works. So if you think there's not a problem in the state of public discourse, this person, this article was in the front uh, uh, flagship journal of the Columbia Law Review. It went right to the White House. I know people in the White House Council who were talking about this and seriously discussing this as an option. So they would much rather discuss things that should be considered a nuclear option legally rather than tell the truth about how public money works. Um, another example here is, well, is, is this stuff really MMT saying anything new? You know, is it, is it just misleading people by replacing one set of 101 slogans with a different set of 101 slogans? And I think a really instructive example here is the case of Japan, because Japan has been issuing very large amounts of government debt for quite a long time. Their debt to GDP ratio is over 250% or something now. Um, and they've been, quote unquote, monetizing that debt by buying up government bonds from the Bank of Japan. So every month, the uh, Treasury spends something like 70 billion yen in deficit, and the Bank of Japan buys up about 90 billion, which means it's essentially monetizing the whole deficit on a monthly basis. There are a lot of very serious hedge fund traders, people whose job was to manage tens of billions of dollars, who believed this can't possibly last, this is gonna cause inflation, this is a complete disaster, and to their credit, some of them put their money where their mouth was. They got wiped out. It was called the widow maker trade. If you were the kind of person betting against Japan, you were the kind of person that wasn't gonna hold onto your money for very long. So this is something where very serious people, people who consider themselves the leading professionals of financial market investing around the world, were repeatedly jumping off a cliff and hitting the ground going splat. And the next person watched and said, yeah, that looks bad, but of course, Someone's got to jump off and do this. You know, someone is eventually going to get this right. Now we're at the stage where I think most people have stopped trying to bet against Japan. But the fact that this happened year in, year out, amongst some of the sort of brightest minds in finance should tell you that these are ideas that even very sophisticated people got really wrong and lost a lot of money on. So it's not simply sort of a matter of everybody knows this. Smart people who should have known better didn't know this, and they've got the horrible uh, paper trail to prove it. Um, another issue is uh, thinking about the future. So my work is on digital currency, and you might have heard recently that Facebook wants to try and create a new currency called Libra. Um, and it wants it to be a kind of global currency backed by national currencies in the same way as Amazon built a delivery empire on the back of the USPS and called it a private company. 
Um, but the, the idea of leaning into the future and understanding digital technology has been very fruitful when I try to explain MMT because even people who think they understand money, even these central bankers who've sort of been at the top of this um, game for a very long time, become very confused when we start talking about digital currency. These are people who sometimes can't even open their email. Um, but they very understand mathematical models about money, but they don't really understand anything to do with technology. So the minute you start talking about the future of digital technology, they become quite open-minded again. And they can have conversations about ideas that if they were in their regular classroom would have, shut, would have been shut down. You know, they wouldn't go on <laughs> television shows with people who talk about them because they hurt their ears so much to hear about it. But the minute you start talking about those ideas in the context of the future, in the context of a digital currency, suddenly everything is back on the table. So when we think about these ideas, obviously we don't need to pretend that they're new and only apply to the future, but that to the extent that, as Bill said, there are certain people who are gonna to go to their grave being wrong, and you know, progress, ideas progress one funeral at a time. Uh, there are conversations where it's pretty blue sky at the moment. There's a lot of work to do, a lot of interesting um, influence making, and there are a lot of people who are not as confident in their predictions there as they might have been about the past. Um, the last sort of little warning in this area I want to give is about um, not doing anything. Uh, Bill was also very involved, much more than me at the time, but I was pretty um, acutely aware of what was going on in 2015 with uh, the Greek situation in, in the Eurozone with the Syriza political party. We had uh, members of Syriza's leadership, including Alexis Tsipras, come to Colombia when I was a law student for an event that we organized that was one of only two events they did in the United States um, before they got elected. And um, we asked them at the time, what are you going to do if Europe calls your bluff? And they sort of said, oh, they won't call our bluff. Um, and I'm not sure how much they believed that at the time, but either way, when the time came and they stopped fighting, uh, it was a pretty crushing mo moment, I think, for a lot of people around the world, obviously the people of Greece, but the other people in Europe and people around the world who thought this might have been the, the chance to actually light a spark that's going to get over this austerity. And five years later, now it looks like Germany might be finally starting to weaken and around the edges. But we're seeing fascists, not only in Italy, in Poland, in Czechoslovakia, in the Czech Republic, sorry, in, um, in Hungary, and I'm not sure if we're going to get through this next round without violence. Not that I obviously want that to happen. But these are places where the support for these governments who expressly call themselves illiberal, they don't believe in democracy, they don't believe in LGBTQ rights, rights for women, etc., have 60, 70 percent public support. These aren't minority governments that have a fringe support. These are countries where the majority of people there are happy with the direction things are going. So not only do we have to prevent that to be the way that things are going to go here, but the act of turning the world around when whole countries now are committing to this kind of worldview is going to be increasingly difficult. So if we don't win these fights, I'm not sure if there's going to be another chance to do it. Um, and it's, a, it's scary to think that if people had been willing to talk in 2015 as they're being willing to talk now, not even the MMT point of view, but even just the mainstream to see how far it's come. Things could have gone very differently then. But in the same way as the Americans were committed to maintaining this myth about money, even to the extent that it meant advocating for unconstitutional behavior as a constitutional law professor, the people in Europe were committed to maintaining the myth that there was enough money, even if it meant that the, the looming threat of fascism got stronger on the horizon. Um, so on that note, I want to just talk a little bit quickly about um, the future of modern money Australia. So as um, Dallas mentioned, I set up an organization in the United States called the Modern Money Network um, when I was at law school. It began with a seminar series. We put on a number of seminars at Columbia with various MMT scholars and others who were sort of t related to or close to MMT on certain points um, in an attempt to show that there is this other conversation because it was certainly not going on in my law school when I was there. Um, and then from there, we turned it into a network where we try to bring in other academics, activists, grassroots organizers to understand these ideas and support each other and work together. Um, one of those people who came to one of our events that we did on 
the need for a new New Deal um, in March of 2018. Uh, was uh, at, at that was at the New School in New York with um, Franklin Delano Roosevelt III, um, FDR's grandson, and uh, that was before all of this Green New Deal kind of stuff hit the hit the news. Um, but one of the people that came to that was Alexandria Ocasio Cortez. Um, you might know that name. She came because my outreach director had been a colleague of hers at the National Hispanic Institute, where they were both sort of rising stars in the in the young Hispanic leaders. Kind of movement, and um, he had come across our stuff through coming to one of the MMT events we'd organised at Columbia. He'd just seen it publicised through his network, so he came across that stuff, kind of had the light bulb moment, read all the literature that was online, reached out to us, got involved, and convinced her to come to an event. And she said, "I'm I'm looking to sort of put big ideas on my agenda. Uh, I'm thinking about this universal basic income. You know, what do you think about that?" And he said. What you want to be thinking about is a job guarantee come to this event. And shortly after that event, which had a number of MMT speakers, um, I think maybe even the next day, the job guarantee was on her platform. And then she got elected. She gave her support to the Sunrise Movement when they were protesting in Nancy Pelosi's office, arguing for a Green New Deal. And now we have, I think, something like eight of the remaining 10 um, Democratic presidential candidates who support a Green New Deal with a job guarantee at the center. Um, and it, it's that small. It takes one person who knows one person who convinces one person and things can snowball from there. So the world is a lot smaller and flatter than it feels, especially in a country like Australia. The number of people here that are probably two or three degrees of Kevin Bacon away from, you know, someone who can actually really change something is, I'm sure, higher than it feels. Um, another part of it is getting together with people. We were, at that point, law students, admittedly at a pretty prestigious law school in New York with a bit of social capital. But all it took for us was to find a room that we could rent. Certainly, Columbia University didn't <laughs> endorse what we were saying in the event, but that didn't really matter to anybody else. They got to go to an event at Columbia Law School, and we had the event publicised and put out on videos, and people could keep watching them. Um, thank you to Notre Dame for hosting us today. Uh, but all it takes is to find a room, and once you build it, they will come. So thank you for everybody who's come, and thank you for the people who organize this event. But that's all it takes. Now, as, as people said, we have chapters now forming or, or looking at forming across the country. And all, the only difference between that existing and not existing is that two people here decided to, to do something about it. So if everyone in this room decided to do something about it in a little way, it could snowball extremely quickly in a city this big. Um, the other story that happened similarly like that was in the United Kingdom, a colleague of mine there I reached out to, or he reached out to me when I was visiting one time and said, oh, you know, there's just no MMT presence there. And I said, well, why don't you organise it? <laughs> You're on a listserv with another 100 people all sitting there complaining how there's no MMT presence in the United Kingdom. Why don't you do something about that? So the next time I came over, they had a meeting at um, UCL. They got a room through an academic colleague who, you know, it was a Wednesday night or something. No one was using it. And uh, it was on, the, the room was held in Gower Street. And so as after that event, a number of people there um, decided to form an organization, which they called the Gower Institute for Modern Money Studies, because we met on Gower Street that night. And now they've hosted, I don't know, what is it, Bill? Probably two dozen events at this point across Scotland, North Ireland, Wales, I believe, maybe not North Ireland yet, Wales, um, different parts of the United <coughs> Kingdom, different parts of England. Um, and they're at the point now where they are having discussions directly with Labour Party members, directly with grassroots Labour Party groups. They're engaging in social media with people who are setting the policy agenda in the Labour Party. Um, they're loud enough to be annoying <laughs> to the people who don't want to have these conversations, which is always the first start. Um, and they were participants in a conference that I went to in February in, the United, in Berlin, which was the first MMT Europe conference. And there were people there from uh, MMT Network in Italy, MMT Network in Spain, MMT Network in um, uh, Germany, Austria, Poland. So this is not something where you're alone. It's not something where it's just going to stay fringe forever. The idea that people of all walks of life are coming together to set up groups to study macroeconomics is not very normal. <laughs> um, outside of, I don't know, sort of Mao's reading circles, perhaps. I don't know the last time people sort of got together to discuss deep level monetary theory on a Saturday afternoon like this who weren't seeing someone with a Nobel Prize or something. Um, but that's a real thing. There's a real question that this community is answering that nobody else is answering. And 
that question is increasingly salient to issues um, around the world. The last thing I'd say is, obviously these issues are economic and they have uh, a dimension that requires sort of careful theoretical treatment and there's a role for um, academic economists to lead that theoretical development. But there's also a range of other things that need to be done. Popularization, education, each one teach one, uh, bringing in art and culture. I'm not sure who developed this um, logo, but I think it's, it's really an amazing one that captures both the sectoral balances graph and the kind of really Australian aesthetic. Um, we commissioned a mural in the US for a job guarantee that we thought sort of captured the spirit of what we think a Green New Deal job guarantee might look like. Um, all great intellectual movements have had an artistic component. Um, all great intellectual movements have had people who turn it into short stories or turn it, you know, turn it into a range of things that go beyond just the sort of dry cut theoretical treatment. And ultimately, people in a whole range of walks of life are going to find these kinds of things interesting if, if they're framed in a way that's relevant to them. I was a music teacher when I start talking about a job guarantee for artists or a way that we could you know, fund public education in a way that's different or a way that we could deal with climate change, suddenly this is not just for monetary nerds or people who sort of read economics on the weekend, suddenly this is something that connects any group that has an interest against austerity. Any group that's experienced people who've been thrown away and who want to believe it's possible to demand that that never happens again. And that kind of thing brings together people across a range of walks of life and to the extent that you know, our capitalist society has made money the one language that everybody speaks, this is a story about that language and therefore is a story that can implicate everyone. Um, everybody here has probably something to offer, whether they think they do or not. And the only question is, you know, what are you going to think about that to be and how are you going to make the best of it? Um, I know there are people here who are standing ready to work with everybody and that's why they, they organise this event. So hopefully you will think about getting involved. And if there's anyone else you can think of that fits any of those descriptions, I would encourage you to encourage them to get involved as well. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. That was brilliant, both um, Bill and Rowan. Okay, so we'll go into questions. Does anyone have any questions? Yeah. This is working. Should when you turn it on, give it a turn it on. Uh, we need the mic so that we've got the, on the video. So if you wait for the mic to come. This is not so much a question as an invitation to the speakers. Uh, one of the things that's commonly thrown at people who espouse looking through the MMT lens is the idea that it's going to lead to runaway inflation, uh, aka. Uh, Zimbabwe or the Weimar Republic um, and yet we see places like Japan and others that don't experience that. Are you able to explain to people who might be puzzled as to why pumping money into the economy doesn't automatically create inflation, why it is that it isn't a logical or necessary consequence of uh, expenditure by government in producing large deficits? How many people have heard about uh, the problems in Zimbabwe? And how many people have heard about the problems in 1920s Germany, the Weimar Republic? And how many people have assumed that it was because of excessive expansion of fiscal policy, aka printing money? <laughs> Come on, fess up. <laughs> Most people who, who make those connections haven't got a clue about what happened on the ground in, say, Zimbabwe. And in one minute, what happened was that uh, Robert Mugabe, for reasonable reasons, decided to award his freedom fighters who had broken the 
colonial yoke and fr liberated the country in some way. He wanted to award, reward them because they were no longer soldiers anymore. They had to do something. And the other thing to understand is that the land tenure arrangements in Zimbabwe were among the most unequal in anywhere. Blacks didn't, the, the locals didn't have it though. The white colonials owned all the land, respectively. So what Robert Mugabe did was, oh, here's a good coincidence, we'll just give them all the farms. And the Rhodesian farms becoming the Zimbabwean farms were the food bowl of Africa. They were incredibly well run by the colonial owners and the farmers, and they were incredibly efficient and productive. And then you put these uh, soldiers with no farming experience to take over that system, output collapsed about 60% in a really short time. Output collapsed 60%. And then it was exacerbated by the fact because there were now food shortages, so the Central Bank of Road, uh, Zimbabwe had to sequester foreign exchange that you previously was given to manufacturers to buy capital and be more productive. They had to sequester it to buy imported food, otherwise starvation would have been the result. So the upshot of that is that even if the f national government under Robert Mugabe had been running large surpluses, they still would have had hyperinflation because of the massive contraction in supply of goods and services. They were running deficits, but that wasn't the reason they had hyperinflation. Now, if we go to Weimar Republic, and I won't, but the same story was the supply contraction these are extraordinary events that are not inform, informing us of anything about what a fiscal deficit does in terms of uh, its impact on the price level. Now, quite clearly, and MMT has said this from the beginning, if the, a national currency issuing government spends beyond the real capacity of the economy to absorb that, remember, go back to my early slide on provisioning, if it tries to compete for resources that, that, uh, that are not there, then there'll be inflationary consequences. But why would a government, a responsible government, try to spend more than is necessary than to achieve full productive use? That's the, it would be a silly government that did that. And we'd have them out pretty quick smart if they started building statues of themselves. Governments do that. <laughs> so that's the answer to your question. It can surely, yeah. A and the other thing I'd say is that all spending carries an inflation risk. It's not just unique to government spending. Our consumption spending can cause inflation. Mm -hmm. Business expenditure. If we have too much exports coming in, that can be inflationary, depending upon the situation. Yeah, the only thing I'd add there, and I agree with everything Bill said, is um, I think it's important to think about the reasons why the narrative that people hear is what it is. There are people who every time something goes bad or someone wants to spend, says, well, have you heard of Zimbabwe? Have you heard of Weimar? These are talking points that were developed sociologically by certain groups, by certain interest groups, by certain theoretical schools or groups of intellectuals who had an agenda that every time any government tried to do something with its budget, it would lead to disaster. So that the answer is to stop trying to use the government's budgets and let maybe private sector actors or the financial sector to do things. So this is not just a story where people kind of learned bad history because it was in their fourth grade textbook and it, you know, it just happened to be crude or something. This had an explicit ideological function to keep telling this story the minute somebody talks about greater government spending. It's to scare people into get, staying away from it. Because you, you might think that you know the poor should have more money or that it would be good to have jobs for people who want them. But if every time you do that, you're gambling with the health of the entire economy and everyone could be destitute, well, OK, OK, maybe it's a little too scary now. Maybe I need to not try that. And it's always a way of making the boogeyman of trying scarier than the real costs that we're experiencing every day of not trying. And I hope that we can get beyond that 
before the real boogeyman of fascism is so, f so far up in our face that it's unavoidable. Because that's the true enemy. If you look in the 1920s, it wasn't the hyperinflation of 1929 that caused the rise of Hitler in Germany. It was the austerity that followed it. And there's a lot of empirical research to show that. Um, the only other thing is to build on what Bill said about spending. And again, to sort of point out the ideology here. Every time a bank makes a loan, it expands purchasing power in a way that can lay claim on real goods and services. So the analogy I use is, imagine if we were at full resource usage, everyone had a job, we were sort of thrumming hot on the economy to, to sort of transition to a sustainable green economy. And then uh, a casino, call it, I don't know, start Moon Casino maybe for, uh, you know, uh, Moon Casino decided it won a $300 million loan to build a big high rise building. And that was going to take thousands of job laborers. It was going to take tons and tons of concrete and steel. Where would that come from? The same kinds of real resource locations that the government spending would. A school might not need to be able to be built because those real resources are now locked up building a casino. But nobody sits there and goes, well, this year uh, private investment has surged. Therefore, we're worried about hyperinflation. I've never heard a single person worry about hyperinflation from, from sort of strong growth in the banking industry, yet that should theoretically be as much of a risk as government spending. So we need to again think about why it is that, as Bill said earlier, only when it comes to increasing new start do we run out of money. And only when it comes to spending by the public sector and with collective organising does it become Weimar Germany. And any time any other kind of actor wants to spend, that's just the market or sound investment. Things like that. I'm interested in um, your opinions on how the job guarantee approach navigates this idea of the fourth industrial revolution where with machine learning jobs are supposed to disappear. Is, is there truth to, in your opinion, about the idea that with the fourth industrial revolution, uh, the jobs are inevitably going to disappear? I'm just interested in what you on that. Thank you. The, the march of the robots. There's various rules of thumb that you have in life, and one of my rules of thumb is when a CEO or more, or more than one CEO of companies that have uh, disgusting labour practices in terms of working conditions and wages pay start advocating universal basic income because robots are going to take all the jobs. That's a rule of thumb. I become suspicious. And my view is that we've always had... Um, you know, if you study economic history and uh, you, you know about Luddites, we've always had fears that technology is going to undermine our standards of living. And, you know, agricultural sector, what, what, what did it used to be? 80 or 90 percent. It's now a few percent of the economy. Manufacturing used to be much bigger than it is. And so we evolve with technology. And... Uh, the, the, the jobs of the future are going to be in personal care services because of ageing populations. They're going to be in terms... Of, they're going to be in environmental care services, uh, fixing up what we've done and making the place livable again. And a whole range of other human-type interactions that are not very suited to AI... And that's not to deny that AI is going to be more than the printing presses were in the 19th century. There's likely to be a lot more jobs disappear. And if, and, and if we ever got to the stage where our material standard of living was being wiped out by capitalists' investment decisions in non-human employment structures then we've got a choice, haven't we? 
uh, outside our, our traffic lights that stop us using car cars to go fast and stop them occasionally so that we can walk across the road. We regulate our, all of our sporting competitions to make them fair and inclusive. And so to me, if it ever got to the stage where it was a serious threat to our, our material well-being that we had machines doing everything, which is not going to happen, then we can regulate that. That's my answer. And uh, my, my, my general view is that uh, we should welcome technology where, where it improves our lives and our interactions. And, that, and, and as one set of jobs disappear, new opportunities to do things that aren't available to us appear. And the last thing I'd say is that uh, the, the future challenge for progressives is to redefine what we call productive work. And at the moment we consider productive work to be something that contributes profits to a private capitalist. And it used to, it's, in the literature it's called the gainful work hypothesis. That's what we mean by gainful work. Well, I think that eventually we're going to be thinking productive work is creating services to to our environment and, and the well-being of people that it's not necessarily anything to do with making a margin over cost. And, the, and once we start thinking about productive work in that context, then the sky's the limit for how many jobs will be able to be envisaged, envisaged I can't say the word, but you can say it, uh, that we think up and uh, which we can then put into action through public sector. The public sector is going to have to be bigger in the future and the imperative of profit is going to have to be smaller. That's it. Yeah, I mean, first of all, the, the amount of people working right now over 50, 60 hours a week globally is still massive. So this is a problem that usually comes in developed countries and usually in communities where the bulk of the labor that is done to produce the goods and services that we live is not visible to us. So as long as there are sweatshops making Apple iPhones, anyone who claims that there are no jobs left to be done should probably not have an iPhone. Or if they do have an iPhone, should be looking at you know maybe sharing that load a little bit with people in Foxconn. Um, then when it comes to the question of, of if there really is a reduction in the amount of socially necessary work, well, first of all, we can equitably distribute that with shorter working hours. Shorter working hours globally, not just within our country, um, which requires some, some degree of international justice. Um, people talk about a Marshall Plan um, to rebuild places that have been destroyed or will be destroyed by the imperialism and ecological harm caused by um, first world global production, uh, part of that is also to take the burden off them and, and to do more in countries that can be producing more than they currently do. Um, in addition, I, I totally agree with Bill, the future is going to be services. You know, I worked in um, family court. We did complex custody negotiations. I don't see a robot being able to navigate the intricacies of how to calm two parents who want to sort of kill each other to make them realize it's about the interest of the child uh, anytime soon. Um, you could probably write a script. I could imagine it being as useless as most of the technology was in that space for quite a while. Um, but more importantly than that, there are industries where what people want is human judgment. So it's not something just where you want to have something provided for you that could be you know, replaced easily by a Turing machine. You're actually wanting human connection. You're actually wanting the subjective judgment of a person. That can be culture, but it can also be things like courts. And one of the issues that algorithms and AI have not been able to address anywhere near to completion at this point or to a satisfactory level is the inbuilt biases of data um, and of the algorithms that understand that data. So that often you have what, they, what people think is a neutral, open-minded algorithm to understand housing market, you know, credit access or something, and the next thing you know, it sounds more racist than uh, Strump Thurmond or something, because it has just read the data, and according to the data, black people are unlikely to have as much income, and therefore they're a bad credit risk, and therefore we should deny them access to a home. And the idea that maybe that data itself reflects historical biases is not something that the algorithm can correct for, because 
the correction requires a theory of justice and the algorithm isn't going to provide that for people. So yeah, it becomes garbage in, garbage out and it also becomes small garbage in, big garbage out because it amplifies and reifies and objectifies, makes, makes neutral or seemingly scientific what was the product of generations of bad social decisions. Um, and when it comes to expanding the definition of work, um, I completely again agree with Bill. I think one of the, the areas here that's really important is to think about care work, you know, particularly what is considered usually sort of women's work or gendered labour in the household. Um, there was a movement for a long time called Wages for Housework, which was an attempt to say, well, we do all of this work, it's unrecognised, you should give us something like a basic income. And there are actually other feminists who sort of launched a counter movement called Wages Against Housework, and they said, look, we don't want you to give us a sort of check, thank you very much for doing all this stuff at home that we somehow have to do. We want to socialise that labour, create childcare cooperatives, create entities that can provide cleaning services and things, so that it's not always on us. If we want to get a job, we can go do that, but to create formal work opportunities out of what is currently implicitly required to be done privately is a way of taking out of those household spheres kinds of labour and putting them into a formal labour context where you can have things like good job conditions, standardised support services, things like that. So in the same way as we have schools for raising children and we have professional health care givers and we're not all relying on that one family member who knows something about herbs or something, that a lot of the work that is currently done invisibly or informally can and should be formalised so that we can have a conversation about what it looks like, how it works, who should be doing it, how we can make sure there's accountability, justice, fairness in that work. And that won't happen as long as the solution is, well, it's too hard to count, it's too hard to measure, it's too hard to put a label on, let's just accept that that's inevitable and just give someone a check, thank you very much. Because at least in my view, that has the opposite effect. It trivialises that work because somebody can be sitting on a couch Somebody can be doing a huge amount of work and they get the same check. There's no recognition of the work itself. It's a payout for giving up on recognising that work as something unique, different from other kinds of work. Um, the only other thing I'd say is when it comes to reimagining work, one of the ways to think about this is to think about the way that Bill talked about at the start. A wage is something you get paid money to do. That's it. That's the simplest, clearest, functional definition of a job. If I pay you to sort of dance up and down, putting your hand on your head, you're employed by me as long as you want to do that. There's no, nobody out there saying, well, that's not real work. You know, somebody's sitting a sign outside saying, you know, free sneakers inside or something. That's work as long as someone's willing to pay for that. So then the question becomes, what do we as a society want to pay people to do? And if you can look outside and not see something that could be improved, well... <laughs> You know, maybe that's an imagination issue for you, but I think most people could probably do that in their community pretty easily. Actually, be observed. 
what, what do you think the, is there any potential in that particular avenue? Yeah, so, you know, maybe, maybe it's the American in me now. Uh, God forbid I can say that. Um, but the, I, I am a little bit more rights-focused now. You know, there's sort of debates here about a Bill of Rights or things, and I understand there are different legal cultures. I actually was also trained as a lawyer in London. Um, but the, the idea of an actionable right at an individual level, I think, is actually a critical part of, this, of the idea of a job guarantee because I think the commitment has to be enacted through public employment programs, but that for it to have teeth and staying power, there needs to go down to the individual level. I've worked for a while with special education, for example, and when students have a right to a free and adequate public education, and then they get a special education sort of program that says we need these additional supports. If they don't get those, there's an actionable right, at least in New York State where I was practicing, you could go to court and say, um, I was told I was going, my child was going to get you know, language support for an hour a week and they're not getting it. Um, and if the school that they were at failed to provide that for a period of time, they had the right to go to a, a private school or get that support elsewhere and the government had to fund, had to pay the bill at the end of it. Um, and I, I think that kind of thing is really important. That said, I don't think that the right way is going to be through international treaties. <laughs> How many divisions does the UN have? <laughs> The answer is not really any when you actually look at you know, where they're coming from. And historically, very, very few economic rights around the world have ever been enforced through taking cases up to the UN. So I think that this has to be domestic level. It doesn't have to be a constitutional right. It doesn't necessarily have to be a human right. Um, Phil Harvey, who's a lawyer, law professor in the US, has written a lot on the UN Declaration of Human Rights as a, as a set of aspirational rights that then frame the discussion of rights at the national level and get implemented. Um, I think that's probably a more fruitful way to think about those UN rights, is to think about them as setting a moral compass that then countries should be held accountable to, um, rather than presuming that they are going to be able to enforce things over a kind of sovereign nation state that at worst come to worse if they're really committed could pull out or do, you know, do something like the United States is doing. Um, so. I think, I think the legal enforceable right is very important. I think the better way to do that would be at a private right of action for an individual in a country and then setting up some sort of commission that would be providing support for that. You, know, you have equal opportunity commissions, things like that.